Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Samantha Tai, and I am the Audience Relations and Communication Coordinator here at InterArts Matrix. Before we continue with today's program, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge that the land on which I speak to you today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral Peoples. The city now known as Kitchener exists under the Dish with One Spoon Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which was originally signed by the Six Nations and the Dutch, but throughout history, other nations such as France and England have also signed on to this treaty. It's made up of three tenets that characterize our collective responsibility. Take only what you need, leave enough for someone else, and keep the dish clean. As a settler, I am also bound to this treaty, and I recognize that I have not always upheld my treaty duties. I also acknowledge that as the daughter of immigrants, I have been afforded certain rights and opportunities that are not extended to the people who are native to this land. Whether we are colonizers or have been colonized, it's important that we recognize the impact that colonization has had because we are all responsible in creating a more just future for everyone. I look forward to a future where indigenous knowledge is centered on national and international platforms and a future where we can all move, together, move forward together in partnership. So thank you so much for attending this afternoon's X camera talk by Dr. Noel Wan. Before we begin, I would just like to share a little bit about the X camera series. So X camera began in the spring of 2019 when a group of people interested in the arts began gathering at Fresh Ground Cafe or the Common Studio in downtown Kitchener. They met every Friday afternoon to hear a lecture by an interdisciplinary artist or professional. These lectures were followed by a question and answer period, and then time for folks to stay in the cafe space, eat lunch together, continue conversations, and build a community. This happened every Friday afternoon until, our, until March 2020, when our gatherings shifted online. It's in this spirit of supporting artists and building community that X Camera continues virtually on Zoom. The series will continue this way at, on Fridays at one for the foreseeable future. Noelle will begin her presentation shortly and will wrap up at about 10 to two. Please feel free to type any questions or comments in the chat as the lecture happens, because we would love to know what you think. After the lecture, we'll have a question and answer period focused on Noelle's work. And at about 2.05, we'll open up the room um, and we invite all of you to stay on Zoom for an informal conversation and networking session. If you are able to stay, um, we would really love for you to introduce yourself, um, speak directly to Noelle and ask questions about her work or share what you have been working on. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Grace Scheel, who will now introduce Dr. Wan and her presentation. Thank you, Samantha. It's my pleasure to welcome Harpus Dr. Noah Wan here this afternoon. Noelle is an alumna of the University of Illinois and the Yale School of Music, where she studied under Dr. Ann Young and June Han, respectively. In 2020, Noelle relocated to London, Ontario, where she is currently serving as Assistant Professor of Harp in Western University's John Wright Faculty of Music. As a scholar, she has written and presented on topics of performance practice, eco-criticism, effect theory, new materialism, feminism, and race. She has published articles in the American Harp Journal and Harp Column. She has premiered significant contemporary works for harp, such as Alwa by Esteban Benzakrai and The Secret Garden by Peter van Ona, and performed the North American premieres of works by Daniel Bjarnson and Uno Vesham. She is an international award-winning harpist and was the youngest first prize winner in the history of the Dutch Harp Festival competition, now the World Harp Competition the only two-time harp recipient of the Chimay Arts Foundation Award, and the only harpist to have won grand prize in the Carmel Music Society's Instrumental Competition, and first prize in the Pacific Musical Society Instrumental Competition. She is also a 2019 Lion and Healy Award Laureate, as well as a two-time semifinalist of the prestigious International Harp Comp Contest in Israel. Recently, Noelle received second prize in the two 2021 or for a music award. On a personal note, I was first introdu introduced to Noel's harpistry through Instagram, 
marveling at the snippets of Liszt, Berio, Couplet, Bach, Tournier, De Falla, Ives, and Grangeny she would post, exemplifying a small chunk of her expansive repertoire and incredible musicianship. When Sheila asked me to host, I was even more excited to learn that Noel will be discussing and deconstructing the image of the female harpist, a topic I feel has resurfaced consistently throughout my career. I mean, think about it. Ask most people what they think of when they think of a harp, and one could safely assume that at least a few people would say some version of an angel cherub or female waif, conjuring images of the sacred divine or, or feminine beauty. As a harpist myself, I've definitely been confronted by versions of this image expectation when it comes to how I present myself. I've had emails tell me that the beautiful harp in the photo deserves to be shown off with more respect than a sleeveless white t-shirt and ripped jeans. To them, I didn't look the part, and I know I'm not alone in that experience. Noelle's discussion today hones in on this imagery of the female harpist, pointedly probing the trope's persistence despite our awareness of it. With that, and with thanks to the sponsors of X Camera, Ontario Arts Council, City of Waterloo, City of Kitchener, and City of Cambridge, I'll now turn it over to you, Noelle. And um, a reminder, just as Samantha said, if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. If you don't wanna post your question publicly, feel free to private message me on Zoom and I will ask your question for you when it comes to our Q&A. Uh, thanks again, and Noelle, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone, I'm super excited to talk about the female harpist and the way in which this trope has influenced my research and even some of my performance work. So let me first share my screen and I am not always the most technologically competent person. So let's see if this is going to work. Okay, uh, Grace, could you give me a thumbs up if everything looks good? Awesome, okay, so today I'm going to talk about the historical relationship between gender and the pedal harp and how that intertwined identity has become embodied in the presentation and practice of being a female harpist. Um, I'm gonna connect this thread with a project that I'm like very early working on it's not anywhere near being finished, in which I disembody the female harpist through various performance practices in the classical harp tradition. Uh, my motivation as both someone who identifies as a classical musician and kind of a burgeoning interdisciplinary artist is to invite self-reflexivity and creative play into not just the sound of the music, which is often where we tend to think, but also how we can imagine the role of uh, our performance spaces and the configuration and expressions of bodies, both human and non-human. So before I start, oh, let's see. Um, I'd like to do just a really quick land acknowledgement of my own because I'm in London. Um, I'll give everyone a moment to read, but I think these land acknowledgements are both symbolic and um, important for us to express. I think as an artist, I think about this, where, like the land I'm actually situated on and as I work, as I think, as I create, um, I should really be conscious of where my ideas are coming from and to kind of position them, not in any centralized or assumed way. And with that, I will move on to the next slide. So first my introduction, and I have all these great images I'm gonna be showing um, all of you today. This one is called Harmony Before Matrimony and features a woman playing the harp and her presumed husband or male partner singing alongside her. So let's, I'm gonna contextualize with some history first. So I think it's important to note that the harp that I'm going to talk about today is the, you know, we call the Western European pedal harp. So, you know, for me to acknowledge that there are many harps in many different traditions, um, and there's many different expressions of harp, and I am not going to focus on those today because I don't think I can necessarily apply my research to those other harp traditions. 
Um, I'm also really focusing on kind of the classical concert tradition. So the repertoire, the presentation, a lot of that is coming out of this really specific tradition. And then lastly, you know, like to always be conscious that, you know, these images and these ideas that we've taken for granted are situated within very specific race, class, gender, and sexuality um, expressions. And then lastly, as I said before, I'm focusing on the pedal harp. So folk harps, even in the European tradition, I'm not gonna really address as much today. Uh, th those are also, you know, interesting conversations, but, you know, my experience is, is as a pedal harpist in the Western classical concert tradition. So I feel equipped to speak specifically to that. Um, one last thing is I just like to shout out my mentor, Anne Young, who kind of was the OG person who's written a lot on gender and the social material history of the harp. So you can check out her research. Um, she's published, I believe, articles in the World Harp Congress Review. And I think those articles will also be made available. I'm not sure. Um, so you can check out what she's written because a lot of what I'm going to be saying today <laughs> comes from her research. Okay, so let's start with some historical context all the way back to kind of pre-1500 CE or formerly known as AD. Um, so in continental Europe, the practice of harp or harping was actually really different from what we later come to know as like being this very female dominated instrument. So, you know, like we have people identify as like harpers or minstrels or troubadours. And these musicians actually spanned a lot of different social statuses and genders actually. So both men and women played the harp, um, poor people played the harp, super rich people played the harp. It was used in like kind of public context and also in courts as entertainment. And the harp was actually just a really popular instrument. And part of that was because it was a much smaller instrument. So you could carry it around. And, you know, in some ways, like the folk harp traditions are much more like directly drawn, I think, from this time period. Um, but the pedal harp kind of comes, also comes from this practice as well. And harps were often used to accompany epic poetry. So there were a lot of themes of like, um, unrequited love or like noble women or battles. So that's where we sort of as, as a concert harpist, like we kind of hone in on this time as being the beginnings. And you can see here, this is a, a um, an illustration. Well, this is like a, a picture of the harp de mélodie, which is a virilai written by Jacquemin de Saint-Lech. Son I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> but it was a, an example of, I think, Ars, Ars, Ars Subtilior, which was just like a really elaborate way of um, notating music. And they, you know, it was both complex and also incredibly like artistically elaborate. But here, you know, the piece, the song is about a harp and therefore he's also created this harp outline for the music itself. But I am not an early music expert, so please don't ask me questions about this later. Uh, moving on, uh, we get to the 15th and 16th century. So here's where things start to get interesting. So if before the kind of like prior to the 1500s, which uh, I guess would have technically been the 16th century, uh, you had this social flexibility when it came to the harp. However, what was going on socially and politically and economically in Europe at the time, continental Europe at the time, actually provided this breeding ground for what would later be the harp um, being a woman's instrument. So hopefully some of you are history buffs and you know, like maybe you can share some of that later, but basically what was going on in Europe at this time was that there was a lot of legislative reform or like church reform and reform is kind of not even the right word because in the case of legislation, uh, women were slowly losing a lot of rights 
And one of the most important ones was property rights. So before women could own land, but after you know these legislative re revisions, women lost the right to inheritance, particularly to property and also to uh, inherit thrones. So basically it was really difficult for a woman to become, you know, like the sole queen. And we know there are exceptions to that, but at this time this was going on. There's also church reform happening. So women also became kind of marginalized in sacred spaces. So you have more and more women becoming separated from men and cloistered, and then you have all these nunneries. And so what's going on with as women are losing their these different social rights, political rights, you have this separation happening where women get pushed here, men get pushed here. And the direction here is actually becoming increasingly private. So women get pushed into these private spaces where they're sort of expected to be, you know, like um, examples of like moral uprightness because women were also seen as being, you know, like sexually symbols of like sexual licentiousness. And so there was a lot of like, oh, we need to like make sure women are corrupting men. And so let's put them all in private spaces. Um, and so what we, what we have is then a lot of gendered spaces and you can see how that's beginning to set the stage for what's going, again, what's going to happen later with the heart becoming a woman's instrument. So that's one thing that's happening socially. Now, the other thing that's really interesting, and this is where Anne Young's research is actually really helpful, is she also draws a parallel between the way the harp itself as an instrument was developing and how that was coinciding with these um, depictions or like, you know, the social depictions of, of gender, uh, mostly in that before the harp was this small instrument, right? It was super mobile and that meant like lots of people could access it. And you can see this actually happening right now. Um, there's, I think a proliferation of smaller harps being made because they're more accessible and so more people can play them. However, between, you know, like the medieval period and 2020, we have this middle period of harps getting increasingly bigger and more complex. And so you can imagine then the larger the instrument gets, the harder it is to move, the harder it is to access. And that means the people who play them are going to become much more niche. So parallel to the gender politics was this transformation of the harp's appearance. So it went from being small and mobile to largeable and less portable. And then these larger and less portable instruments required a change in the way we played them. So instead of standing and walking, maybe, or standing and singing, that we had to sit down and remain stationary. And also then your body kind of has to restrict its movement because of the sitting position and the size of the instrument. So, you know, if you can imagine every picture of a harpist that you've seen playing a large harp, you know, we're all sitting with our hands like this. And that kind of restricted movement, I think, comes from you know, the way the harp changed. At, at the same time, of course, in addition to the harp's construction, you still have lingering notions of love and, you know, like noble women. This is still, this is all still happening. So the imagery or like the perception is staying, the instrument itself is changing. And then the women are also, the women's, the women and the, like the role of women in society, that's changing. Um, so what we have is kind of this increasing convergence of all these, all these ideas, all these social changes happening, and the harp becomes a place where those ideas converge, like, oh, like, the way we see women is different, and our expectations for women are this. This instrument actually provides a lot of the qualities that we expect women to have. So this is a great instrument for women. I mean, this is my loose logic. Um, there's one other thing too to consider, which is the invention of the arpa doppia, and this is the double or triple strung harp. So this instrument added another layer of complexity to all of this, all these swirling ideas, which was the arpa doppia was a really kind of complexly made instrument and a lot of mechanisms, and it was really difficult to play. So with this harp, 
um, you have all these music theorists and philosophers kind of projecting this idea of elitism and nobility to the harp because they're like, oh, this instrument is really hard. It must be a sign of rarity and superiority. And therefore a harp is also this rare and superior instrument. So between all of these ideas, the harp kind of was gradually losing its popularity as well. Um, part of which was it just, it wasn't, it wasn't mobile. It didn't have as much practical use and it was becoming kind of more and more drawn more and more into these private spaces. So what ends up happening as you get towards the 17th century is the declining social mobility of women and that kind of colliding with the way the harp itself was changing musically and um, in terms of like the way it was constructed as well. And then it, what ends up happening is that the harp has this idealized reputation as elitist, feminine, noble, and that's all again feeding into the next several hundred years. And then what we have is a dual marginalized, marginalization of the harp and of women. And as a result, they find each other. There's this convergence happening. Okay, so now we get into kind of the core period that we often think of when we think of like angelic imagery. So the 17th and 19th centuries, like between this period, we have the invention of the pedal harp. So the pedal harp was invented in actually the 18th century, the single action pedal harp, and then the double action pedal harp was invented in the 19th century. So I have these images, you can see they're extremely ornate and I mean, I kind of cherry picked the, the gold ones. <laughs> I'm sure there are ones that weren't gilded, but these ones you can see, they're just ex extremely, it's like very Baroque looking, but like um, clearly, you know, an object of luxury, clearly very impractically designed. And, you know, like nowadays, modern harps aren't, aren't, aren't half this elaborately done. And in some ways I think harpsichords now are, or more elaborate, but you can see how the instrument itself reflects a changing, you know, like changing social sentiments. So by the 17th century, the harp has kind of disappeared from mainstream public musical life for all of the reasons that I had just talked about. Like it wasn't as easy to access, it was hard to play and it got very large and it was hard to move around. So like the very, the kind of the very uh, conditions that make something popular, often accessibility is kind of the biggest one, means that, you know, like, okay, well, not that many people are gonna do this activity anymore. So by the time, you know, both the single action pedal harp and the double action pedal harp get invented over the 18th and 19th centuries, the harp gets, becomes this like kind of very specialized instrument with equally niche audiences. And so from these pictures, we can also see that the harp also gets transformed into a garish display of wealth. And you have, you know, even like paintings. And so all of these are going to be very expensive, which means, we're also, in addition to marginalizing the instrument by gender, we're also marginalizing it in terms of class. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, like at the time, this was probably many years ago already, you know, like when Apple introduced the rose gold iPhone and things like that, when, you know, we, we design these luxury objects and we make them more attractive, particularly to like even a certain sentiment. So I think even with the decoration of these instruments, you have cherubs, you have flowers, you have, you know, pictures of ladies, uh, society ladies, that this was also meant to complement the people who are playing these instruments as well. Um, Anne Young writes that, Form subverted function, the pretense of performing music provided the listener with a feast for the eyes and overt vanity and display were remedied by the activity of music. So we really get suddenly like this explosion of like imagery, it's a feast for the eyes. And therefore, as expected, like the royals pick it up. So Marie Antoinette is like one of 
the key figures. She made the harp really popular amongst the French elite. And the harp with its kind of increasingly fiddly specialized chromatic mechanisms from the, from the pedals became, you know, even more so a symbol of refinement and noble upbringing of prestige in women's spaces and of luxury decadence and frivolity. And one of the things we know, of course, that, you know, playing musical instruments was a key part of a kind of women's education. So anyone who's been watching Bridgerton, for instance, probably has picked out, you know, where the young women are supposed to be well-trained in music to show off their eligibility on the marriage market. And the harp actually was one of those instruments that was perfect for that because in addition to, you know, it, it being an instrument, it, you, you had to be stationary. So you weren't like moving your body around and being indecorous. Um, and it also looked really aesthetically pleasing. What's particularly interesting in 18th century France was there's all these, you know, like social depictions that actually hypersexualize women at the harp. So it's this really weird paradox of how women, like the harp was great for women because, oh, it's like angelic and demure and you can't move around a ton. However, somehow people also found a way to be like, well, women also look really sexy playing this instrument. So there's a interesting book chapter. This is also, I think, I've made available to Samantha, so maybe you'll be able to access it. Um, there's two, two scholars have shown several examples of this hypersexualization, including like the use of harp lessons for male teachers to kind of become, to get closer to women's bodies. And so like even the position of the harpist at this, you know, at the instrument was considered really sexually alluring. Um, because she was supposedly like, you know, she's like spreading her legs and she has, you know, her bare arms and neck and it's like complementing the curve of the instrument. So like when I think about this, I'm like, was the instrument accessorizing the woman or was the woman accessorizing the instrument? Um, that line gets really blurry. So again, we have this other paradox of women being or the heart being this like site of female decency of being like a very feminine thing, but also being kind of a sexually transgressive instrument. Um, and the way kind of women were positioned at the heart, the way they played their instrument made them these like sexual ob objects as well. So we're also going from just like the symbolism to now also this objectification that's happening. And one other like kind of juicy tidbit also from these two scholars is that during the late 18th century, actually the phrase to play the harp, <clears throat> sorry, in French became a use euphemism for groping and pleasuring a woman. So I'll just leave that out there for all of you to, <laughs> to figure out what that's supposed to mean. Um, so as we get into the 19th century, you know, as with many arist aristocratic practices, the harp then trickles from being like a, something that the upper classes do to something that the middle classes want to do. So what we have instead of like luxury and like kind of noble femininity, we, that gets replaced by two ideas. One is the cult of domesticity. So, you know, like women as being caretakers of the home and then the angel of the house um, metaphor, which was that women were spiritual figureheads. So with these two, you know, I have this quote from a book called The Habits of Good Society. Women's very mission is to make life less burdensome to man, to soothe and comfort him, to raise him from his petty cares to happier thoughts, to pure imaginings toward heaven itself. So we have this now this other layer of like, oh, women are supposed to be spiritually good. And we're in some ways like kind of moving away from this sexualization. Um, but from the sexualization, we, are, we get objectification. So objectification has stayed. And now that objectification though is, has found a new home, which was like, okay, well, women are supposed to be in charge of making the house, the home a peaceful place. They're supposed to, 
soothe their husbands or brothers or fathers. And the harp is also a great instrument for that. Like, why don't we just continue dragging the harp through all of our different, you know, like perceptions of, of women and make it fit. So, so you have then a lot of women continuing to play the harp in the home, in these private gendered spaces. Um, they were, women were often discouraged from being professional musicians, although we know historically there were female professional musicians. They often though came from musical families or musician families, or they were of noble or like highly educated, uh, from noble or highly educated backgrounds. And then, as I mentioned, like musical skill became this marriage asset because it showed the woman's refined sensibilities. And in, case of, in the case of the harp, it made her even more physically attractive. And so there's an 1898 Cosmo article that says, the knowledge that at no time is a pretty woman more fascinating than when throwing her white arms around a harp works advantage to the instrument's career. So this mosaic of like, oh, people who play the harp should be pretty. They should be pure, but they should also be sexy. Like all of that is a lot to manage. And then that kind of translates into the way, you know, these portraits of women at harps are, you know, you have like women who are sitting stationary, but then they have like exposed arms and they're also kind of smiling in a, I mean, like not, it's not, necessarily seductive, but they're like supposed to show a little smile because not smiling is seen as being too stern, right? So they're supposed to be inviting. And all that, you know, keeps moving through. People look at these images and they're like, oh, that's what a harpist should be. Um, and then they pass that down to the next generation who sees that again. They're like, oh, okay, I guess that's what a harpist is. Let's keep perpetuating this. So you can also see though with like this harp getting very big compared to the earlier images is that again the stationary nature of the instrument especially now with the pedals confines the player even more and Anne Young calls it an effective chastity belt um, so strangely though like at some point the harp did actually fall out of a favor because as I said like it was also paradoxically an overly sexual instrument. So I think the harp is just really people like the, the people's relationship with the harp and with women is just very confused. Like they can't decide, is it overly sexual or is it overly demure? Like we don't know. And you just get like a lot of conflicting ideas and images then fomenting over the years. Um, However, when this is where like I, I personally like diverge from this whole discussion of the history of just like recognizing like, yeah, there was this relationship between women and this instrument. A lot of it comes from the way the instrument actually developed and also the way people viewed women differently over the years. Um, but one thing that, you know, Anne Young, she doesn't really talk about as much is how like this relationship between like the restricted bodily movement or the way the harpist is situated the instrument how that like bleeds into even the way like we're taught to play the instrument like how much of like this position or the way we sit at the instrument how much of that is coming from you know these ideas about women and sexuality and you know i i kind of see these parallels in what i call like disciplining the body for both the cultural reasons and like the technical ones, the ones that have to do with like how we learn the instrument. And there's like a lot of emphasis on like, oh, like you gotta place your hands really perfectly and your feet can't dangle. Like they need to be, they need to be positioned just right because, you know, and we've argued like it's for the health of the body or it's just because it looks better. And so we have this phrase, phrase it looks better. Like, where's that phrase coming from? Maybe it's coming from actually like this earlier time period in which women were expected to look a certain way or women were playing this instrument and positioned at this instrument in a way that made them like aesthetically attractive to a public and oftentimes men. And so like, you know, I, in my opening slide, which I won't go back because it involves doing too many things, 
I kind of, I juxtapose all these in, images of, you know, these historic portraits in which like Harpus are placed like this with really modern images that also show Harpus playing like this, just to show that like, you know, like actually not much has changed. That maybe like the way we look changes, who's playing changes, but these like really bodily concerns, this positioning, this configuration of, of body, that actually hasn't changed very much. And how much of, you know, like the female harpist or like what we think of when we're like, oh, the restrictive image of the female harpist maybe that like, it's all, you know, angels and blonde women. Like how much of that actually is, like how much of that is actually the only reason rather than thinking about like, you know, what, what is the way we play the instrument and whether or not that also needs to change. So, as we get into the 20th and 21st centuries, what's happening is again, like the relationship between what's happening in society and how that actually changes the image and the perception of the instrument. So before we had women's rights being eroded, we had the marginalization of women into private spaces. We had, you know, like femininity and class influencing the way harps and women looked. As we're getting into the 20th century, like, you know, as we know, there was a lot of social change happening. And then of course with the wars. So for women, it was like suffrage and labor movements, like women could work, women could be professional musicians and they didn't just have to stay at home and, you know, like suit their husbands anymore. And so with that, it meant like you could, you would see women in different, different professional situations now. And that meant like, oh, we have a little bit of agency to, you know, like express ourselves differently. You can see though, like these pictures I've chosen, I've, I've chosen actually a diverse array, both male and female harpists, because we actually, you know, like in the 20th century, I have this photo of Carlos Salzedo, who I have mixed feelings about, but he's credited with um, kind of a lot of innovations to the instrument, including, as you can see, this his Salzedo, like his Art Deco harp that eschewed kind of the curve like the floweriness of the older instruments but was about like clean lines um i have thoughts about the whole salzado thing people can ask me <laughs> that separately um but so so salzado was kind of an important figure for the like harps pr makeover and he was really keen on like oh we need to make the harp like not a woman's instrument anymore it needs to be taken seriously However, in the, you know, on, meanwhile, his, he still has a lot of female students who possibly are all playing the harp for the same reasons that harpists in like the 19th century were playing the harp. Uh, we get people like, uh, you know, Zena Perkins here who does a lot of experimental work. And you can see here, she has a very different harp. And even maybe like the way she plays that, this instrument because it's so different looking might actually be a little bit more you know, like removed from this pedal harp, you know, dainty woman imagery. In the same way, you know, we have Laura Samoji down here who does a lot of work with FX pedals. Like it's the same thing where you can see that she's not, she's not restricted by her, the, you know, like the stationariness of the harp, like she, because she's working with other technology, she actually has to move her body around in a way so you could one could argue like okay she's subverting some of the way in which like technique and gender kind of might be related and encoded um deborah henson conant here also like she plays a, she plays a small harp so you can see like her body language is really different um we have some other concert harpists this is katrina finch she was like one of the early like oh i can make the harp look sexy um and you know, like badass. And I think some of it was mostly image, although she does interesting work. And we have also someone like Emilio Cesson who's like, oh, I'm going to play not just the Salcedo harp, the Art Deco harp, but I'm going to play a red one. <laughs> and, and then we have someone whose work has been most, has been actually in genre, which is Alice Coltrane, who's very influential in jazz harp, that what she was challenging was like, oh, the harpists have to be white. 
and harpists have to be, you know, like angelic, like she was doing some fairly different things. And then up here we have Harpo Marx, who actually I think of as being a very subversive harpist and, you know, Andres Follenweiger, who was extremely commercially successful. So we have is again, a mosaic of like really different perceptions and approaches to the instrument. However, what I see as being a point that doesn't get addressed enough is like how much of representation actually changes our practice. So again, this goes back to like, okay, we can have a lot of different people who look really differently or who like express themselves really differently. But if we're all playing the harp still like this and we're, you know, like we still approach our repertoire the same way, like how much of that is really digging into this gendered history um, that actually informed these practices and repertoire that we still play now and maybe haven't changed our approach to. So what now? I have, here's a picture of the Angelaires, which was an all-female harp ensemble that was founded by Carlos Salcedo. As you can see, they're all perfectly positioned and wearing like basically the very stereotype of what a harpist is, I, I think is encapsulated in this image. Uh, I also have this great quote from the Mirror of the Graces or the English Ladies costume, which is, the shape of the harp is calculated in every respect to show a fine, fine figure to advantage, the contour of the whole form, the turn and polish of a beautiful hand and arm, the richly slippered and well-made foot on the pedal stops, stops, the gentle motion of a lovely neck, and above all, the sweetly tempered expression of an intelligent countenance. These are shown at one glance when the fair performer is seated unaffectedly yet gracefully at the harp. The reason I love this quote is that it really fixates on the way the body is positioned with the instrument. And that's something that I've decided to fixate on as well in my work. So I will talk very briefly also just for the sake of time. I may not get to all of these things. Um, what does it mean or like how do we how do we respond to this idea of the female harpist? And I think on the one hand, like we can resist the image of it, right? We can subvert that she has to be, you know, stereotypically attractive, blonde, thin, you know, all, all of those kind of identity markers. However, there's another way that we can think about her and we can use her as a trope and respond to that in our own work. So I'm going to get kind of theoretical for a moment. So for those of you who maybe don't have or, you know, like feel overwhelmed, it's OK. Uh, you can maybe space out for a moment. <laughs> like the way I think of the female harpist is like, you know, she has this history. She has this look that but she isn't really real. And definitely at this moment, you know, like we don't see her in every single harpist that we meet. And we also don't really want to talk about harpists as being, you know, the female harpist. Um, so I, you know, like we call her a stereotype or archetype and, you know, we want to get fancy with our language. I might even use words like specter or trace, or there's a buzzword, you know, like in the arts uh, that is palimpsest. Everyone likes using that word. <laughs> so what, what these like kind of fancier words means is like, she's kind of this image that haunts who we are and what we do now, even if she's not immediately there. And the reason I use the word haunts is that I think of, you know, like our technique or our repertoire, or even like the way we choose our, you know, like our performance wear, all of that kind of is drawing from this history. And that's, I think that relationship, that historical relationship, I think is where we can get really creative and not necessarily just focus on like, oh yeah, like that image is bad and the opposite is good. Like that kind of binaristic approach. Um, and here, you know, like the confrontation versus negation, which is basically to like, look at this female harpist and be like, okay, like what can I do with you? Rather than be like, I don't want, like, I don't want to look at you. I don't want to think about you at all. But you know, there's a lot of things that we can do when we confront this image. One of the things that 
I'll talk about some practical approaches. Uh, and, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to integrate this in my own work is number one, thinking about the performer audience relationship. So the thing about an image and the way an image is perceived is that you need to have someone who's perceiving it. So female harp is the reason I said she's not really real is that she's made real by people who are looking at her. So what that translates into like when we're performing is like, okay, so I'm here on stage, people are watching me, they're projecting something, they're projecting some desire or identity or expectation onto me as I play. So even if I'm like, oh, I don't wanna be that image, um, you know, like I'm trying to show myself to be something different that you're, you're go going to have people, your public or the people you're playing to who maybe think otherwise. And so, you know, like a really good theoretical paradigm to think to like kind of draw parallels to is gender performativity um, coming from Judith Butler. And, you know, she was talking about how, I mean, very, very casually you could say like gender being constructed, but what she was really saying was that gender is comprised of actions and like kind of the way we, we use language. And all of those things stabilize a gender identity. And so in the same way, this like performativity of female harpists is like, there are actions and the way we talk about her, the way we present her that stabilize who she is. So that collective imagination really is where I think we want to challenge or maybe like play with a little bit. What that means is, you know, in terms of the performance audience relationship, I think you can like maybe subvert what the audience expects. So I had, you know, like I'll talk about one idea I had, which is, you know, you like show extreme, extreme, like stereotypical femininity on stage, but maybe, you know, you're wearing this beautiful dress and you're like made up to, to kind of fit that stereotype, but say you, fall on stage, which actually happened to me recently. I fell on stage. I was like, oh, this is the most horrible thing that has ever happened. But also maybe I'm subverting what people expect of me. But it could be something like that. Um, basically, you want your audience to think like, okay, I want this harpist to fit my imagination of her, particularly when we're speaking of female harpists. But, um, but also like maybe what we can do then if you are female or female identifying is like, take that expectation be like, okay, well, how can I surprise you? How can I maybe, or maybe like show who I, who, you know, I as a female or female identifying harpist is by treating my body or the instrument in a way that the audience might not expect. And so what that also could translate into is that like maybe we get rid of this audience stage relationship too like maybe that is a huge part of projecting imagination is like you have someone sitting on a stage and almost like we see that performer as an object because it's like in front of us and when we have an object it's easy for us to project our desires onto it and maybe if we change that spatial configuration too that that object audience object or like spectator object relationship changes as well. Um, so a lot of this like confrontation or this like practice approach is about exam, like thinking about how we can change relationships between who's watching us or who we are and who's watching us. It's a, you know, like, again, kind of theoretical, but a really interesting thing to think about. One more thing is uh, and I may have to stop, but one more thing is thinking of the performance space as a potential space, which I took as, a, it's a term from a psychoanalyst named Donald Winnicott. Basically a potential space is, it, look, the context of it is talking about like a infant and mother, but if we think of the performance space as a potential space, then what that allows us to do is to kind of discover who we are, like discover something, um, like engage in a process of discovery, I guess is the best way of putting it, rather than being like, I am, I know who I am, or I'm trying to express something that's fixed for you to see, but maybe like, you know, our, our identity 
being a female harpist, like maybe that's something that we explore in real time on stage and the audience has to accept that or they're like kind of bystanders to that process. Um, and this is why, you know, I use the phrase or I use the word becoming rather than being because becoming implies like a process that maybe will never stabilize either. Um, and very quickly, if for those interested, um, Bertolt Brecht and Antonin Artaud, who had very different, like kind of opposite approaches to theater, but they had some interesting ideas about, you know, how to consider the audience in uh, a theatrical context. Okay, so very quickly, I talked about subverting aesthetics. You could do it by, say, like, if the audience expects the harpist to be, um, you know, like positioned stationary on stage, that you are mobile, you're like moving around, you're using kind of like called vulgar, which is like just moving in a way that people are like, oh, that's kind of weird. And I don't expect that at all. And I feel uncomfortable, but like, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily the performer's job, at least in this particular way of approach, approaching, you know, like the female harpist is, it's not our job to comfort them. And actually that whole idea of comforting, like that's coming from, you know, like this expectation that women were supposed to soothe their husbands or fathers, right? So if we're like, okay, well, we want to actually subvert that, then let's do stuff that makes people uncomfortable. Um, you could involve like really wild, noisy pedaling, or even you don't even have to look at the audience. Maybe you're facing away from the people who you're, you're spectators. Um, these are all strategies. Like it's not just about the way we dress and the way like we present ourselves on stage. It's what we do in relation to the harp that could really, you know, help us renegotiate what like female harpist means. Um, the last thing is, particularly for me as a classical musician, like I'm working with a lot of old repertoire, right? Like the stuff written by dead white guys. And, you know, like that will always be a part of my practice, even if I try to introduce as much new repertoire. So what I think about is, um, re I guess, rethinking that kind of canonic repertoire as artifacts. And what I mean by that is, instead of like, oh, you know, music is a universal language, like, oh, this piece is really beautiful, like that beauty transcends time, to be like, okay, this piece comes from a really specific time. It kind of had a specific purpose or it was responding to a really specific idea that, that's situated um, in time, but also it's situated within, you know, like a kind of racialized, classed, gendered, sexualized place. So if we think of that repertoire then as artifacts, then we can also use them as artifacts rather than being like, oh, I'm, I'm picking this piece because it sounds pretty. Or I'm picking this piece because I think, you know, like it'll match the sound of the other piece. But it's like, okay, well, say I, you know, like I'm playing a, a piece by Elias Parrish Alvarez, who was, who would have been writing in the uh, early mid 19th century. I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe the sound of that, I can use that to evoke, you know, like that salon culture because the aesthetic of it is certainly reminiscent of that salon sensibility. And so then I situate that in my program specifically so I can get my audience to kind of transport themselves into that, that aesthetic time. Um, so it's just, it's a little bit more of like an intellectual approach, I guess, to music as well. but. I think it has, again, like a lot of great potential if you're wanting to subvert, you know, like an idea. So just, you know, like for fun, I put these two images together. One is just a harp on fire. And the other is what I think of as being kind of this great example, example of performance art by um, Lamont Young, who's an American composer that he has a famous, one of his famous composition 1960 pieces was to build a fire in front of the audience and preferably to use wood, although other combustibles may be used as necessary. And I was just thinking like, I mean, if you got a cheap harp, because obviously you don't want to burn an expensive pedal harp, but like, you know, what would it be like if you like walked on stage 
and with your like big fancy dress and then just burned a harp on stage like what would that mean um, we're getting into definitely like performance art territory <laughs> so I will end there I know I said a lot of things and I have a final my final image gem for you is some movie called the harpist with the tagline one man's dream is another man's obsession um hopefully my talk today offered you know the beginnings of a glimpse of how you know women and the harp have been related historically which then in turn informs the contemporary imagination of the female harpist so really what i'm workshopping in my own artistic practice is how to come to terms with like the classical harp tradition and namely how like being a woman or identifying as a woman um you know like that is actually that actually implicates you know the pedagogy like the technique that is part of my instrument's practice and how we might find ways then of responding through new practices and new forms not just new like expressions of identity so the way out of you know like sticking just to representation which representation representation is important but i think it needs to be accompanied by practice um i think you know it's it's important to not just like reject what we don't like or reject what we think is wrong but to kind of take what what the, th the thing that we find problematic and really work through it and find ways of like reassessing the relationships or, you know, in some ways, like sometimes it's even finding the, the satire that we can, you know, we can <laughs> use just to be like, hey audience, you wanted me to be this, but instead I'm gonna present this, this other thing to you. So I think it's important, you know, like, especially also now when we talk about, you know, like decolonizing practice to not legitimize the boundaries that something of you know a discipline like classical music often sets in its practice that we need to like <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing with my hands but like we need to dismantle some of it a little bit and then to situate its history and practices within more vulnerable and open spaces and I think you know like that's the object objective of interdisciplinary in the arts so that's the end of my talk I will pass it back to Grace or Samantha. No, oh, lovely. Thank you so much for, um, you can stay on mic, um, Noel, but thank you so much for the discussion. It's also lovely to see so many harpists in our, in our chat today. Um, if you guys wanna stay on, we're gonna be opening up the floor to questions. Um, I know for me, as you were talking, Noel, um, one of the things that I was thinking about uh, in terms of the harp tropes for city across um, history and, and how we perform today is also classical musicians within the wedding harp industry and that idea of there being an economic um, kind of incentive to betray that idea of a beautiful harpist and in, in some cases how that might interact with um, how this image continues to be kind of produced within our, our harp community and musical cultures.